Blog Talk Radio. Want to be a survivor to another restoration and good morning. Glad to be here. Seven o'clock here in the morning, Calgary, Alberta. Oh, August the eleventh, twenty seventeen. Yeah, just having a coffee, waking up, and and uh, just getting ready for the day here. And uh, glad it's Friday. So I hope your week was good. You know, I do uh, two shows a week here, just looking at really a morning reflection, positive reinforcement, sort of self care things like that. Um, just sort of so I'll stay on my healing journey and not put it off and uh, not put it away for six six months to a year and then have to go back to it. So that's why I do these shows. Hopefully they're helping somebody else out there. And, uh, you know, if you're a survivor of abuse and you're just starting out on your healing journey, you have to you have to listen to it really carefully. Make sure that you're safe enough to be listening. So, you know, if you're not sure if you're safe enough and, you know, that you're not going to hurt yourself or somebody else or be triggered, you know, and have a miserable day, then you need to get that information and, and uh, turn the show off and, until you really know whether you're safe enough or not. You can get it at... Uh, several different places, but Havoke has got some safety information there for survivors of abuse as well as um, um, uh, adult survivors of child abuse, ASC, a Morris Center program. They have a Survivor to Thriver workbook, and uh, you can get that there for free too just by, just you can read it online or you can download it or whatever. It's a huge workbook, Survivor to Thriver, and um, but they have a, a Safety First chapter there it's like 60 pages long, and I read the whole thing a long time ago and was really glad that I had really gone through the material. It's very, very important. You need to make sure you're safe enough. So if you're not sure, you need to turn the show off and, you know, anything like this, really. Be careful what you're listening to and make sure, you know, that you're safe enough to listen, for sure, because you don't want to have a miserable day and be triggered, and that's not good. And anybody else, you know, you have to listen at your own discretion because I'm talking about abuse. Abuse is a very sensitive topic, you know, not... Uh, not a pleasant subject, so if you're just not sure if this is going to bother you, then you need to just turn the show off. You won't be hurting my feelings, you know. Listen at your own discretion. Ultimately, it's your choice, right? Um, so, yeah, we'll get into this, you know. Um, I had a good week, sort of. This is a morning reflection, really, for me um, and for anybody, really. We, as survivors of abuse, can look in and see, you know, how am I feeling? What do I need to work on? We can do this every day. I actually do this every day. Um, you know, how am I doing? Any particular particular things that I need to work on? How am I feeling? Um, feeling pretty good. I really had a busy week. This is the first two weeks of the month are always really busy for me. So I don't have a lot of time to do much of anything that I wanna that I'm working on. So I tend to get more stuff done in the last two weeks of the month, but the first two weeks are always just really busy with bill paying and running errands and getting things done and all this extra stuff that comes up. So I rarely actually have time to work on my stuff that I'm working on the first two weeks of the month. So I haven't got anything done. I haven't been working in my workbook. I'm working in a workbook right now. Um, and I had put, I've put it off now for a while because I can't get back to it. But hopefully this weekend. Um, it's Wounded Heart, Hope for Adult Victims of Childhood Sexual Abuse. Uh, Dr. Dan B. Allender with Karen Lee Thorpe. And this, it, I've got the book in the workbook and it's really um, helping me out. So I want to get back to that. And uh, maybe this weekend I'll do some work in it because I've done, a, oh, I don't know if I'm about to a third of the way through and I want to keep going in it so it's really helping so that's something I need to work on haven't been able to get to other than that I'm feeling pretty good I wasn't really triggered this week by anything um you know I always have a sort of a residual stuff going on but it's nothing um you know too hard to deal with I'm getting much much better as far as anger issues go and um as far as depression goes or things like that or just uh a feeling of moroseness sort of thing. I'm actually at a better place now than I've ever been in my entire life. Probably I've been uh, working on my healing journey now for the main part of it for, oh, what are we, about eight years now. So um, 2007 is really when I started my healing journey, but 2009 is when I really started doing the bulk of the work. So 
2009. I was looking at about eight years now. Um, so I've gone a long way, you know, so I feel a lot better these days. But I'm still triggered by things, absolutely, and I probably always will be. And um, I handle it a lot better nowadays. And also just uh, stressful things going on in my life, I'm able to handle stress a little bit better than I used to be. Um, I don't feel so overwhelmed as easily. You know, I still get overwhelmed. I think that's normal um, for people, but I don't get so overwhelmed that I just can't handle things. So I'm, you know, things are getting a little better slowly, slowly, slowly. It doesn't happen overnight, and I do have breakdowns. I do have meltdowns <laughs> periodically, meltdowns where I just fall apart. But I'm able to pick myself up a lot easier. I don't spend a whole lot, you know, I don't spend as much time in that meltdown situation that I used to be in. Um, so I'm able to cope better. I think my coping skills are much, much better now than they used to be. And so just from working on this stuff, you know, it's a lot of work, it's hard work, but I'm really, I'm glad to be on this side of it because I know what it's like to be on the other side of it and it's horrible, right? So this week really didn't have a, it was just kind of a uneventful really, um, just busy trying to get stuff done and trying to get some rest too, was not, not sleeping well. I never really sleep well, that's another one of my problems, but I don't like to take sleep, um, sleep aids, you know, to try to help me to sleep. I'd really want myself to do it myself, you know, and I have a lot of, um, Oh, I would say weird dreams. I dream a lot of very strange stuff. And they keep me very busy at night, my dreams. I'm always dreaming. And when I wake up, I generally remember most of what I was dreaming about. It's very, um, they're very uh, bizarre dreams. So that's always an issue, just getting rest, you know, and stuff like that. But otherwise, I had a pretty good weekend, so I hope your week was good, too. We'll get right into this. We're picking up where we left off with anger from Help for Adult Victims of Child Abuse, Havoka. That's uh, H-A-V-O-C-A dot org. You can go there and there's uh, information for survivors tab. And if you go to that tab on the left-hand side of the page, there was, it's actually at the top. And then once you click on that, all the information will be on the left-hand side. And there's like an anger tab there. And I did pop the link into the chat room. So that's there if anybody wants to check that out. And um, we left off just the beginning part of this anger article. And uh, just saying that they were saying, you know, that, that uh, anger can be used as a tool or a weapon, really. It, you know, um, anybody who's been abused has experienced it probably as a weapon. And then we learned how to use it, <clears throat> excuse me, as a tool, right, to get get our needs met. That's what our abusers were doing, right? That's or anybody anybody's abuser really uses things as tools or weapons. Um, but anger's, you know. I, I've done a lot of studies with anger, I'm looking at anger way back. You can go through my show pages if you want to. I have no idea. It's way, way back there, probably 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. Looking at uh, angerresources.com. You can check that out. That's a really good website. Um, Dave Decker and Michael Obsatz, they did a, a website on anger. They have, a, they have a, I guess they do uh, workshops and they're kind of like counselors, right? Anger management counselors. They have some great info there about anger. And um, I learned a lot about anger. I didn't know much about it. <clears throat> I just knew I had a lot of it, a lot of anger and rage and problems dealing with my own anger and also dealing with other people's anger. And anger is necessary. It's uh, it's absolutely necessary for us to know how to how to properly use anger. <laughs> Because it is a necessary thing to have. We've got to be able to be angry. But we just need to do it properly, right, without hurting people or hurting ourselves, right? So it's very, uh, this article is quite interesting here, too. It's not as long as their info, but I just wanted to take a look at it because it's very interesting. They said, um, so we left off uh, where they said um, that it can be used as a tool, you know, or we, we can learn that anger is a weapon and we can use it to keep hurting people keep people from hurting us by hurting them first, right? Or maybe, you know, we've experienced possibly anger as abuse, right? Yelling, hitting, threatening, overpowering. So we see it as something that's very bad, right? Anger. And I know I still do. I have prob- I, I'm still working on anger, but it's much better than I used to be um, as far as dealing with other people's anger and also even my own. So um, it takes time, though, to, see, to recognize this stuff. So they said, so you say, how can... Anger possibly be anything but a weapon. How can it be a tool? And they actually, they have like a little scenario here, like set up. And they said, consider the following scenario. A female adult survivor who was abused by her father is working on her recovery issues and discovers that that she is feeling anger toward her mother, a non-offending parent. So when told by the daughter about the abuse, the mother expresses horror that such a thing could happen to her daughter, disbelief that her husband could have done this, and remorse that she did not know about it soon enough to stop it. 
The daughter, realizing that her mother knew nothing about the abuse when it was occurring, feels guilty for feeling anger toward her mother and tries to talk herself out of doing anything with her anger because she believes it's irrational for her to feel this way. Is the daughter using her anger as a weapon or a tool? If she manages to ignore her anger and stuff it away, sooner or later that anger will come back to haunt her in the form of self-destructive behavior. If she blows up at her mother, yelling, calling her names, hitting, etc., she's being abusive. So in both cases, she's using anger as a weapon. So if she decides to talk with her mother about her anger, expressing it without becoming abusive, she's using the anger as, she's using the anger as a tool for healing herself and healing her relationship with her mother. So this is quite interesting. They said, let's assume with this particular example that the daughter is angry with her mother for not protecting her from the abuse by her father. And says, how could she protect her daughter that when she didn't know even know about it? You ask a seemingly logical question. But logic doesn't apply here. Feelings aren't logical. Emotions that stem from childhood abuse are experienced from the perspective of the child at the time of the abuse. That is, when you feel angry with your mother for not protecting you when you were being abused at age five, you're feeling your anger from the perspective of that perspective of that five year old, not from the perspective of the adult you are now. That five year old wants um quote unquote mommy, their quote unquote now, right? Mommy now, right? To protect her. It is that past awareness of a need for protection that results in these feelings of anger. They said, uh, we need to deal with them in the present in order to resolve them. They won't just go away. It's quite interesting, you know, that's true. Um, I've, you know, I've read the, this in several different places where, you know, a lot of the feelings that we're feeling today towards our abusers and stuff, of course, is coming from that that young person, that young um, child that we were being abused, that's where that's coming from. But then as an adult, you know, we it, it's just it just carries over. I don't know if it's so much just only that five-year-old. I mean, even for myself, I sit there and I think about my own situation, just thinking through this stuff here. You know, I mean, I had a lot of anger towards my parents, both of my parents, and towards my brother, who sexually abused me. And, you know... The anger that I was feeling, with, you know, because we were my siblings and I were just abused for for life, right? It didn't just start and end within a year or something like that. Like we were just abused from birth, and that's just the way we grew up. Very dysfunctional, abusive environment, child abuse, domestic violence, and whatnot. And then my brother sexually abused me for almost a year. So the anger that I have comes goes so far as far back as I was born, right? And I didn't really recognize it until I got older that I wasn't getting my needs met because I was just growing up in this situation that I thought this was my life so I just figured this was the way it was for everybody until I got out and started meeting other people got older and started seeing other people the way they behave especially school friends you know parents of my friends that I would see and meet and realize that that's not life wasn't the same way at, at their house as it was at mine so I started to realize there was problems but you know Otherwise, how do you know what the norm is? <laughs> it's whatever you're experiencing, right? So I was just brought up in this horrific situation and um, didn't realize what it, what the anger was all about anyway. Um, by the time I was 10, I wanted to be dead. And I was very angry at my parents, uh, very angry at my brother for sexually abusing me. Um, I couldn't deal with that. I was already being abused with, by my parents. So the CSA child sexual abuse, I stuffed it. I didn't know what to do with it anyway. I was just traumatized by it, and I think I, my friend thinks uh, my friend who's a um, psychotherapist thinks that I might have um, sort of um, dissociated a bit, DID. Even though I don't lose track of time, so I don't think I have a problem with that now. I don't have uh, segments of time where you know I don't know what I've done with my time because I've got another altar in there somewhere. I don't have DID as far as that goes, but she thinks I might have disassociated, disassoci disassociated at the time, just for protection for my brain, right? Um, absolutely horrific, this stuff, you know, and this anger just built up and built up and built up and became rage, just from the physical assaults, uh, all of it, the emotional abuse, the psychological wounding, um, it was just horrific. And I knew it was imploding because I didn't want to hurt anybody else and I didn't want to hurt myself. I, well, I, I did hurt myself a little bit, but I didn't want to hurt anybody else around me. I just didn't think that was fair to be abusive to people around me just because I was abused, you know. So I just, uh, the anger just, I stuffed it and stuffed it and stuffed it. And then um, I knew it was going to be a problem and it just imploded, you know. So then I, I had a real problem with suicidal ideation at that point because I couldn't take it anymore. And so these things are really difficult for people. And I wouldn't even say that it was just my my small little ones that, you know, five or six-year-old, like they're saying here, that the anger that I'm feeling today 
is actually that anger from myself when I was, let's say, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know. So I was being abused at all those ages, right? So I wouldn't say that the anger that I have today is the anger from just from that those wounded children that I was. So I think they're kind of not actually being, they're not being completely, I don't think it's all that accurate, to be honest with you. And even if a psychotherapist was to tell me today that what I'm saying is not, it, it just isn't accurate, I really don't care because a lot of my anger stems from my adult, my, my grown self, you know, let's say from the age of 21 and up. <laughs> I'm old now, so, you know, that's, that's old. So, you know, let's just say that it, some of this anger that I have is actually anger from my adult self. Just, you know, how could my parents do this? It was not okay what they did. How could my brother do what he did? And they didn't care, you know. And then, you know, my family didn't care. So how, it's not all just anger from my little wounded self parts, even though part of it is. A lot of it's my adult anger as well. It's not just that little child wanting mommy to protect her or wanting mommy to stop abusing her, right? It's me as an adult being very angry about what they did. And I think that that anger for myself is okay. Because I should not think that it's okay what they did. You know, I should not sit there and just think it's fine what they did. That would be, that'd be warped. That's like some people that just back up abusers, right? Say, oh, well, they didn't know what they were doing. And, you know, they just had problems. And so we have to forgive the abuser. It's like, we have to just accept the fact that they, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. Start getting to, that's a bit of, that's actually a form of denial is what that is. It's just a very, what do you want to call it, passive aggressive form of denial. <clears throat> it's kind of like, oh, let's just back abusers and, you know, it's fine. It's like, no, 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 it's not fine. It's not okay what they did. They can never make it right. It'll never be, I'll never be able to change it. I'll never be able to, to get restitution or anything else from, you know, justice or anything. And even if I could, it wouldn't change it because you can't change the past. It is what it is. So now I've had to learn how to live today in today's life right now knowing that it can't change the past then how do i reconcile it this is why i'm doing these shows because and it is very helpful because then i don't have to go back into denial and say oh you know they were just victims themselves you know my parents were abused and they just didn't know what they were doing oh they knew what they were doing and you know my brother he didn't know what he was doing oh he knew very well what he was doing <laughs> you know it's like no i can't i'm not going to play the denial game that is denial to go ahead and say that, you know, we just have to just let go and all of this stuff. That's denial. It absolutely is. Um, I'll never be able to deny what happened to me as a child and or my siblings, you know, because I'm not playing the denial game. What I am doing is learning how to not be okay with the abuse, but to be okay with the person that I am today because of the abuse, you know. I have to accept myself for for who I am, knowing where I've come from, and knowing what I was put through as a child and then how hard it's been as an adult to maintain, um, I have to be okay with myself. That I'm okay and I do that I, that I'm doing good, that I'm that I'm exactly where I need to be because of the horror that I survived. Um it's not gonna be a perfect situation. But whose life is perfect? No one's. So people around us, you know, sometimes I think as abuse survivors, we sit and think, Oh, everybody else just must have these awesome lives. I used to do that, you know, when I was especially when I was a teenager. <laughs> I sit there and think you know, these other kids must have just awesome lives. You know, their parents aren't probably beating on them and their brother's not raping them, you know. But actually, this is not true because everybody's got something going on in their life that's horrible. And um, maybe not as bad as yours or bad as mine, right? But it's it's still bad, you know. I mean, uh, no, there's no perfect situation, right? So the thing is, is I mean, I, I have to look at my life and not judge it against other people's, right? And that's where I think I've made a lot of progress is because I don't try to live as other people do. And I also don't try to judge myself according to what other people are doing or how how they live their lives or how they're doing. I just actually don't pay much attention to other people at all. I just work on myself and I'm not really concerned what other people think about me or my life or anything else. I really don't care. You know, they weren't in my shoes. They're not in my shoes today. And so how can they possibly even understand where I've been? You know, even if they wanted to, to try to understand, they wouldn't really be able to get there. Um, so, you know, I don't care what other people really think. Um, it's really my own peace of mind that I'm working on, my own heart, peace in my heart, peace in my mind, which then will 
probably, you know, is, is I guess, at this moment manifesting in my body because, you know, the mind and the, the body and the, the heart, you know, it's all very connected. <laughs> and so you got all three of them, you know, and, 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 and the spiritual aspect, I mean, I have no problems there. But, uh, you know, this stuff is very difficult, especially with anger stuff. And um, I know for myself, you know, I mean, people say, do you still have anger towards your abusers? I mean, yes, I absolutely do. But it's not the same level, let's just say. I don't have the same rage. And I think it, and I, well, actually, I don't even think, I know the reason why is because I did this program called Your Envisioned Mind, um, which used to be called Forget Talking Therapy. <laughs> but it's, it's a great program, man. This thing, it's, it's, a, it's a program that I have to keep using all the time. It's not something I can put away and just do it one time and that's it. It's a, something you have to maintain. So I have to actually maintain this program. It's a, it's a tool to use for my mind, for my brain, for the limbic system in my brain. Um, but it's inner child work is exactly what it is. And I go in and I have to then deal with my inner children and what's going on. And this has helped me out in the anger arena. <laughs> it certainly has because I don't have the same rage. I don't have the same, you know, I don't have the same um, desire to self-injure. I don't have the same desire to, as far as suicidal ideation goes, you know, my anger issues, I mean, they're they're so much better than they used to be. And I think it's because I've been able to work out a lot of stuff with my inner child, my inner children. I have, I have lots and lots of them. <laughs> and they're all, they're all where the trauma occurred. Wherever the trauma occurred, that's where my inner child was wounded. That's where I was stuck. So I was stuck in so many places. You know, I was stuck as an infant, you know, one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old. And it just goes up and up and up all the way through, you know, to I've got some adult ones in there too. So, you know... People, I didn't even think this stuff was real, this inner child stuff. But when I started do work, doing the work on it, I realized, like, wow, yeah, this is the real problem. I've got a 10-year-old in there who, who is so angry and so hateful because she's been so wounded that she wants to self-injure. She wants to kill. She wants to, to destroy. She's like the destroyer in my life. She busts things. She rips things up. She tears things up. She is unconsolable. I can't get her to, she doesn't stop crying. She's, she's not crying in the corner. She's just angry. That's my, that's me. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I don't want to destroy my adult life because I'm having a nice life here with my husband. He's terminally ill, but you know, hey, things happen. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not being abused, you know, now as an adult, things are great. I'm not being abused. I can work. I can hold down a job. Thank God. Um, I have a cat that I love dearly. I don't have any children because of the CSA child sexual abuse, but I have a cat and I just love her. You know, she's like a blessing. So I'm not being abused. My life today is great. So it's that's where I realized, wow, I've got all of these inner wounded parts of me that are really still running my life. And this is what they're kind of talking about here. You know, that this anger that they're saying, this anger you're feeling from the perspective of that five-year-old, you know, not from the perspective of the adult you are now. I don't necessarily agree with that because I think a lot of it comes from my adult self too. Just knowing that abuse is wrong and what they did was wrong and they never even apologized for it. Even if they would have apologized, it wouldn't make it right. But I would have loved it if they would have apologized because then I could have at least really, really wanted to forgive them. <laughs> but, you know, now I'm like, well, I don't know. You don't really deserve it. They didn't ask for forgiveness, so I don't think they really deserve it. So, uh, you know, that's just kind of like, you know, this is me being snarky, but I don't care. What, what they did was incredibly wrong and I'm never going to be okay with it. I'm never going to be okay with the abuse that they put me through. You know, I'm never going to be okay with what they did at all. That was wrong, and abuse is wrong, and that's why I know that I have a sound mind, right? Because <laughs> I'm not bouncing back and forth going, oh, it's okay what they did. No, no, it's not okay what they did, and abuse is wrong, and child abuse is wrong, and we got to stop protecting the abusers, pretending that it's okay. Oh, they, this grandma didn't know what she was doing, or, you know, Uncle Joe didn't know what he was doing, or whoever the person who the abuser is in the family. It's generally 95% a family member or somebody the child knows. You know, this is incredibly wrong, right? And so I have, I'm have. i glad that I, I, I have the line straight. I know where the boundaries are, and I know what's right and what's wrong. And this is why I think I'm doing so well on my healing journey, because I'm not confused about the lines. You know, my mother, I loved her dearly, but that doesn't excuse away what she did to me, not at all, or to or to my other siblings. It doesn't excuse away what she did. My dad, same thing, I loved him very much. It doesn't excuse away at all what he did to his, to his wife, my mother, or to his children. So I'm able to draw the lines. 
you know. And my brother, I mean, before I was, when I was seven years old, before he sexually abused me, I loved my brother very much. But after he sexually abused me, I didn't love him anymore. And uh, because he sure showed me how much he loved me, you know. He hurt me. And so, you know, do I love him now? No, not at all. And, uh, well, he's dead, uh, suicide. But the thing is, is, you know, do I forgive him? No. No, absolutely not. Not, not, not. I don't. I, I'm not going to forgive what he did. No, and it's, and I'm not going to be okay with it and just say, oh well, he was sick. He was psychologically ill, which he was. He was on heroin. He was, he was a drug user. I don't care. That's not my problem. That was his problem. And the abuse that he inflicted on me caused, uh, you know, basically damaged my life. Right. I, you know, so this is the issue. The abuse is not okay, and I'm not going to sit here and justify the abuse, right? By saying, "Oh, we just have to learn to," you know, that I was just a little me that was upset with my mom. You know, my adult me can be okay with it. No, no, that's not right. That's not. We need to be very. You got to be very careful with the war, with the lines, where the lines are, and what's right and what's wrong, and protect yourself. You know, don't be allow don't don't allow yourself as a survivor to be re-victimized. Because there's family members that say that, oh, well, you should just get over it. And, you know, it was a long time ago and they just, they were struggling. They didn't know what they were doing and all of this stuff. Because this is what happens in families, right? Because the other people, they still need or have this desire to stay, to to be around the abusers. And so they think you should too. (laughs) And it's kind of like, no, you know, you need to protect yourself and make sure that you're protected. Make sure that you are not being abused today. You know, if you're a survivor of abuse, don't be revictimized. Get the information on revictimization and learn how to keep yourself safe. It's very, very important. And we need to learn how to use anger properly so that we're not hurting ourselves or hurting somebody else, right? And we'll pick up the rest of this article on Monday. There's a little, quite a little bit more of it. And it's quite a lengthy article. You can go there, havoka.org forward slash survivors forward slash anger. That's the actual uh link to it. So positive reinforcement, what am I doing? What are we doing right in our daily walk, we could say? What am I doing? That's that's good. I actually got on my rower, which was really great. I've been working on that. I've been trying to get on it for like a year and a half. I've had it for a long time. It's collected a lot of dust in my living room, <laughs> my rower. And um, I thought, I need to do some exercise, and I don't have a lot of time, so I need something I can just jump on really quick. And I can't ride a bike because my hip's out of place. I'm really screwed up. But I can do rowing. So I thought, yeah, I'll get on the rower and I'll start getting some, you know, exercise because I seriously need some exercise. And I actually got on it, like I think three times last or this week, three times. So that's a step in the right direction. Finally, <laughs> I got out and got some fresh air. Had to do some errands. That's another positive. Um, well, I'm working on my healing journeys. That's a positive. There's all these things that we can look at and say, well, you know, I'm trying. I got up this morning and I'm doing the best I can. That's a positive, right? We don't have to be so down on ourselves all the time. It's so easy to get down on ourselves, especially after coming out of abuse, everybody dumping on us or getting down on us or abusing us for some reason or another. We don't have to do that to ourselves. We don't have to beat up ourselves. You know, we've already been through enough, right? So I think we've been through plenty enough. And we need to look at some positive stuff too and not just always just the negatives, right? So if you're getting out of bed this morning and you're actually lifting up your head off the pillow and you're smiling because you know that you love yourself and that you deserve so much better and that you're going to make it or that you're going to try every day, you know, to to just get a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger, a little bit better. Well, that's a positive reinforcement. You're doing something in the right direction. And we need to just look at these little things, you know. Oh, I washed my hair today. Oh, I fed my cat. That's great. We're looking after you know, looking after ourselves, looking after our cat, right? Well, we've got about a minute left here. So, yeah, these are the things that we need to work on. Next uh, Monday, we'll look at some um, positive self-talk, finish that article up, and then we'll start some of the, the uh, self-esteem affirmations and stuff. Those are really good. So, you know, I wish you a really good weekend. If you're struggling, like I say on all my shows, you know, make sure that you get some help. Don't struggle on your own. I'm so glad that I finally started reaching out, you know, getting some help. I started out really mainly just reaching out to other survivors, and um, then I started anonymous group um, support. I joined a, two anonymous group support um, online groups, which was very helpful. And uh, and then I just started getting the help other places. And I don't really um, trust counselors and therapists, but I know that there are good ones out there. So whatever you do, make sure that you get you you get yourself some help. And I made a deal with myself years ago. If I was struggling and I was thinking I just couldn't go on, that I would call a crisis line. So I'm prepared to call a crisis line now. If I get to the point where I can't do it and I just can't 
I don't even know how I'm going to go through another day, which has happened to me for a long, long time, thank God. But it does happen. And so what I'm saying is if I've got it in place now, that if, I, if, if I'm if i struggling and, I'm, and I can't cope, I'm going to call a crisis line. Absolutely. I'm going to get help because I so deserve it. So do you. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Take good care of yourselves until the next time. We'll see you Monday back here, same time, same place. And um, hopefully uh, it's a good weekend for you. Take care.